Dear learners, greetings from IIT Guwahati. We are in the MOOCs course Power Plant System Engineering, Module 2, Vapor Power Systems Part 2. Till this point of time, we have covered the thermodynamic aspects of a vapor power plant, followed by the expansion of steam in steam turbines. So, there we had two important concepts of steam turbines, one is through impulse principle, other is through reaction principles. So, based on that we have classified impulse turbines and reaction turbines. So, in this lecture we are now going to see some of the performance uh, indicators for steam turbines. There is one particular concept what you call as axial thrust. Normally, this axial thrust is not recommended, but it is mostly it has to be there uh, and it has some practical significance as far as handling or fixing the rotor is concerned. Then uh, we will see some of the design aspects of uh, steam turbine blades. Uh, we have impulse turbines, you have reaction turbines. Necessarily, uh, the, the design features of both the turbine blades are different because impulse turbines are mainly intended for high pressure steams and reaction turbines are mainly used for moderate steam velocities. Then having said this, uh, we will now look into some of the losses that is normally encountered in the steam turbines. Although these losses needs to be minimized or uh, losses cannot be completely ignored. So, how to minimize the loss that is the another uh, features for steam turbines. So, we will discuss them one by one. So, let us briefly understand what uh, steam turbines we have learnt so far. So, in our previous lectures, we have exhaustively discussed about single stage impulse turbines in which we have the rotating blades or normally this we call as a wheel and these blades are mounted on a rotor. And, uh, nozzles fed the, uh, the steam, we have steam nozzles that feeds the steam to this rotor uh, or blades. So, as a result it rotates. Then other category of turbines we have is velocity compounded impulse turbine and pressure compounded impulse turbines. So, many a times uh, a single nozzle and a set of moving blades does not solve the purpose. So, we require compounding and this compounding can be done in two aspects either we can incorporate multiple nozzles for each set of moving blades and such a turbines is called as a pressure compounded turbines or rative turbine. Uh, so, here the advantage is that since each nozzle supply the same uh, pressure steam uh, that means each moving blades are supplied with their individual nozzles. So, this is something like that multi-stage impulse turbine. Another way of looking at the compounding is the velocity compounding which means that single nozzle supplies the steam to the set of moving blades and uh, the exit from the moving blades are uh, again reoriented to another set of moving blades through a passage normally called as stationary blades or many a times you also call this as a guide vanes. So, through this process we can draw this pressure and velocity characteristics along this length uh, or uh, along the passage through which the fluid moves. And uh, the last turbine that we discussed is the reaction turbines and uh, in this reaction turbines is uh, we call as a Parsons turbines where the pressure drop of the fluid has happened in stages and in the initial category the pressure drop is higher and towards the later part the slope of this pressure curve is different is less. So, each of these turbines have a different advantage and disadvantage, but however, these main common features for all kind of steam turbines is to find their performance indicator. 
So, this performance indicator for impulse turbines which is normally referred as a D level turbines, we have derived the expressions how much work is being uh, done per unit time. We have also calculated the kinetic energy of the energy of the jet that is impinged from this nozzle. So, this is V S 1 and uh, then we can find out the diagram or blade efficiency and for the single stage turbine uh, we also derived the expressions that for a given velocity and angle theta at which the fluid jet impinges there is a particular speed that blade must operate that is optimum blade speed and uh, uh, normally all the uh, turbines operate at their optimum speed because uh, we get the maximum work and then we can find out the blade efficiency. Another important feature is that if uh, when we have uh, from the inlet to outlet uh, if you draw this velocity triangles there may be possibilities that uh, the relative velocities are not equal. So, in that case we define a parameter velocity coefficient in fact this is nothing but the loss that is encountered when the fluid flows through this passage. Then from each one stage whatever work we derived and if you divide with respect to the uh, total enthalpy drop then we will find out the stage efficiency. And in similar philosophy when you say reaction turbines we specifically referred one particular turbines which is a known as Parsons turbine and it since complete reaction mode of operating turbine is impossible. So, we say this Parson turbines is 50 percent reaction turbines which essentially means to us is that 50 percent enthalpy drop takes place in the fixed blade and rest 50 percent drop takes place in the moving blades. So, in a sense that if you uh, one the basic difference is that we do not have a nozzles rather these fixed blades uh, or we call as guide vanes act as a or serves as a nozzle actions for the fluid which is being directed to the moving blade. So, with this philosophy this uh, we can have a full stream admission uh, around the rotor periphery and uh, of course, uh, these blades are curved in opposite directions. So, that the fluid passage can be aligned in a particular directions as I, you can see that the way we are tracing this path then we can see that it uh, goes along this fixed uh, and moving blade passage and the, the stream that enters from the set of fixed blade and that stream that leaves from the moving blade. So, accordingly the pressure drop takes place and um, absolute velocity change that happens in each of the blades. So, here also in same sense we can find out what is the rate of work or power then we can find out optimum blade speeds. We also have a blade speed ratio then we can uh, get uh, also maximum work. So, similar numbers also can be defined. Since we have in a reaction turbines uh, we have um, moving blades as well as fixed blades. So, we define the efficiency in two parts one is fixed blade efficiency the other is the moving blade efficiency. Here we can see that in a moving blade efficiency it is nothing but the, uh, the work that is being developed to the energy which is associated with kinetic energy of the jet plus the enthalpy drop in the moving blades. In same sense also we can calculate the nozzle efficiency then we also can get the stage efficiency all these enthalpy terms we can refer this conditioning curve for a two stage turbine where we can plot the enthalpy and entropy data and from this we can find all these enthalpy values and accordingly all these efficiency parameters can be calculated. One more important factor normally we have not referred so far is the reheat factor. So, I also mentioned that in uh, my uh, previous lectures that if you recall this conditioning curve or normally this Mollier diagrams as shown in the figure, 
we have seen that uh, when you go along these constant pressure lines, these constant pressure lines diverge and diverge as and when if you are going for higher enthalpy. So, that means, we can uh, get a uh, since they diverge, we take the advantage of higher enthalpy drops at higher pressure stages. So, for that reasons, the steam in the design point of view, we operate this the turbines at much uh, higher pressure or and temperatures and mostly we, we operate in the superheated regions. So, for that reasons, we since we take this uh, advantage of uh, divergence in the uh, pressures at higher stages, we can uh, find a ratio uh, of the individual enthalpy drops to the enthalpy drop of the turbine section or for the entire stage and that is referred as the reheat factor. So, referring to this particular figure, if you want to find out the reheat factor and your initial state is 0 and final state is P4 that is 4 T s H 4 T s and so if the process has to take place in an isentropic manner, so enthalpy drop would have been H 0 minus H 4 T s. Now, if when we are going in stages, so one fixed plate and moving plate sta gives one stage, another set move fixed plate and moving plate gives another stage. So, for each stage we can find out the what is the isentropic enthalpy drops. So, if you keep on calculating them, then uh, we will find out the reheat factor. So, it will be plus so H 2 minus H 4 S S. So, this uh, numerator and denominator ratio will give you the reheat factor. So, uh, in the first stage of moving blades it is H 0 minus H 2 S S and in the second set it is H 2 minus H 4 S S. So, this total enthalpy drop that happens in each stage which gets added and it is divided by had this process been isentropic what would have been the enthalpy drop that is H 0 minus H 4 T S. Then we will move on to next important concept is axial thrust. So, normally what we say in our analysis is that uh, if you rec refer a simple velocity diagram of a single stage impulse turbine, we see that we have a blade velocity V b and uh, this blade velocity is achieved the when the when your stream jet impinges the blade at an angle theta and leaves at a some at velocity v, uh, leaves at an angle delta with V s 2. So, as a result we have V b and this V b velocity is nothing but the uh, total wheel velocity which is nothing but the combination of inlet and velo outlet velocity triangles. So, there are two parts one is wheel velocity that is V w and other is axial velocity that is V a and this V a comes when if we V a direction is almost perpendicular to V w, but only difference is that if uh, there is if your relative velocities are not equal uh, v, that is V r 1 and V r 2, then this axial velocity will come into pictures. So, this part we will discuss uh, some while solving the problem how that axial component arises. But however, in a pure impulse turbine blades there is no axial thrust. So, that means there is uh, due to this axial thrust there is no resulting work. So, entire work that comes by virtue of this wheel velocity V w. In a similar sense also for reaction turbines we the blades are uh, designed in such a way that means this blade passage or fixed and blooming blades are designed in such a way that uh, the fluid always passes through this sequence of fixed and moving blades in a organized manner. As a result we try to ensure that there is no axial thrust due to change in the momentum of the fluid stream. But however, what happens since uh, there are since the reaction turbines are operated at 
different pressure stages. But due to these things, we have some axial th thrust component that arises in the low pressure stages. Another important point is that when you think about because these moving blades are kept uh, in the rotor and to keep this rotor uh, at a in a running conditions we also require some kind of balancing force so for that reason in some sense axial thrust value should be as minimal as possible depending on the requirement or the design of the turbo machine components then uh, we'll try to see uh, some design aspects of steam turbine blades so, till this point of time we have been talking about uh, to uh, the, the shape of the blades uh, and we all have been talking about this velocity triangles. So, one of the critical features that uh, we have this is that we have the angle theta, we have this angle delta which is relates the stream velocity at the inlet and uh, exit of the blade. We also have uh, relative velocities and uh, at the inlet and exit of the streams and the we have also important angles that is phi and gamma and all these angles has to be synchronized in such a way that we require a fixed blade velocity vb and to achieve this fixed blade velocity and we also have to to minimize this axial thrust and the angles are designed in such a way that we have highest velocity coefficients at the same time we have fixed blade velocity and um, uh, to do that these angles are adjusted. For example, if you look at one particular reaction turbine in one set suppose if you say like this particular velocity triangle which is drawn here that means uh, the stream velocity V s 1 when it impinging the blade at an angle theta. So, we have uh, for this theta we already have some fixed delta and uh, this gamma and here also we have uh, this delta and gamma. But if you look at these things now this uh, in this particular case what we see is here that is for this uh, B S 1, B R 1 and B B this B R 2 can take this angle uh, can have this line or can have this line or can have this line. So, there are possible that means with different phi the, the relative velocity at the exit velocity triangle can be controlled. So, this is one aspect. Second aspect is that now across this blade we may have uh, different velocities that, is, that means if you take along the mean line of the blade or if you take at the tip of the blade if you take at the base of the blade. So, tip stands for here and base stands for here. So, if you say tip of the blade uh, we may have velocity uh, which comes as a dotted line like this and when you say base of the blades we may have land of dash dot dash dot thing blades. So, in other words what we see is here whatever velocity triangles we have drawn so far that is drawn for mean blade speed, uh, but however in reality the blade speed varies from the tip to the base and because of these reasons we have issues like a partial admission uh, of the fluid and diameter is also not constant because the diameter varies from the base to tip. So, because of this reason we require the need of uh, the blade designs and this velocity diagram has to be drawn with respect to optimum conditions. So, considering these aspects we what we all need to do is that we have to design our blades and then the shape of the blade has to change from tip to the base and this when you put these diagrams in the reality then what the configuration that generates is known as twisted blade or warped blade or vortex blades because the blade velocity varies from tip to base and for our analysis we always take this mean value which assumes uh, some angle phi uh, and based on this the all the designs all the thermodynamic calculations are made. Then we will move on to next important topic which is losses in the turbines. 
The arrangement of a particular turbine to suit a specific purpose requires many considerations and that uh, some important consideration that includes the losses. Sometimes uh, losses are inevitable, but at the same time we as a designer we must en ensure that losses are minimized. Now, in the thermodynamic sense, the uh, one of the important loss that is a irreversible phenomena and we call this as a super saturations. We will come back this theory of the super saturation now. Apart from this thermodynamic loss, the other uh, internal losses that takes place that can happen as friction losses in the nozzles, blades, discs which rotates the fluid. Then we have leakage loss during fluid admission st in stages, seals or glands. Then we have moisture losses, then we have residual velocity losses and in addition to the we that we have some miscellaneous losses that occurs due to heat transfer, there could be losses due to mechanical and electrical losses. So, this we call as a miscellaneous losses, but our main important losses are super saturation which is a thermodynamic losses and other losses like friction, leakage, moisture, residual velocity. And in fact, we will try to see that uh, this uh, some of the losses we have to retain for a better performance of the plant. So, let us see what is the first loss, first concept which is super saturations. So, for super saturation, let us understand this Mollier diagram. In which we have uh, plotted two pressure lines, one is high pressure P1 and low pressure P2 and the steam is being expanded from this point that is let us say this is point 0 and uh, to let us say and it encounters uh, many stages and it let us say it is finally 4, 4S and 4. But what happens during these uh, stages for this during this uh, expansion process the fluid encounters various enthalpies. And if you on these things, if you, if you superimpose the saturated vapor lines, you can see that 0 4 s is the enthalpy isentropic drop and 0 to 4 is the actual drop. And during this passage, the fluid comes some intermediate stage, one is the it encounters the saturated vapor line that is at point 1, which says that just in the vicinity of uh, in this vicinity that means just before the line and after this line just before the line the fluid is vapor and after this point 1 the fluid is liquid. So, ideally this is what the thermodynamic analysis says, but uh, in reality does not happen that means if you carry out such a high pressure or high, uh, superheated steam and try to expand it in this manner. Uh, so, at instantly the fluid does not come back or steam does not come back from vapors to stage to liquid stage immediately. So, there is a condition that exists we call it as a metastable equilibrium. That means, instantly it does not change its state rather it, it takes some time to respond and while uh, doing that say th that uh, the coordinates has already changed. So, actually the fluid becomes liquid at point 2. So, instead of in the vicinity of point 1, it now the uh, becomes liquid at point 2. So, essentially what does this mean for us that is that there is a loss in the enthalpy values between this point 1 to 2. So, that means the steam is actually becomes liquid at state 2 but it should have been become liquid at state 1 and this is a metastable situations and this is this happens in a in real sense. So, likewise we can draw different pressure lines we can create a band which is called as a Wilson line for each enthalpy drops we can draw this an, draw another curve or with what is called as Wilson line which will tell you that the locus of Salsos curves which says that in reality where the fluid uh, where the steam becomes liquid. 
and such a steam we call this as a super saturated or undercooled steams and the locus of point 2 at varied pressure for forms a band or zone and we call this as a Wilson line. Now, to counteract this particular uh, effect we define or to counteract this losses due to super saturations we define a term which is called as a degree of super saturation or degree of undercooling. So, it says that the ratio of actual pressure to the pressure corresponding to lower temperature is called as the degree saturations. Of course, these two points are at two different pressures and we can take this ratio and that is called as a degree of super saturation or degree of undercooling. And after two the, the thermodynamic equilibrium achieves and we say it is it happens we can uh, after this point two the thermodynamic equilibrium is established and the uh, which is detected by the pressure volume diagram at point 2. So, the initial and this what is this phenomena that initial condensation, condensation results liquid droplets of small diameters with large curvature and subsequently they grow to a larger one. Since uh, this particular expansion process uh, is uh, across an Wilson line accounts for this sudden condensations with release of enthalpy of vaporizations, but at the same time it results sudden pressure rise with reduction in the specific volume and velocity. So, in steam power plant point of view such rapid expansion in turbines and nozzles is normally referred as condensation shock. Shock is nothing but a um, phenomena across which the changes are very drastic and it is an instantaneous changes and whatever changes that happens that happens in an irreversible manner. So, more details of the super saturation I will come back again when you discussed about the steam nozzles. Then moving further losses uh, we have uh, other type of losses which is called as fluid frictions. Fluid friction is very common and whether you say it is impulse or reaction turbines I have already emphasized that the fluid has to follow the uh, certain path or the enclosed passage between the fixed and mo moving blades in a successive manner. And uh, since it is encountering different fixed and moving blades, it is expected that there is a there has to be a losses. And of course, since the purpose at which the velocity triangles are designed, same quantity of the fluid may not enter into the subsequent stages and, and that also happens uh, in either in a compounding board for pressure as well as a velocity compounded uh, turbines and because of and this since they are entering in different stages and there could be a possibility of admission loss as the steam passes from the nozzle to wheel. And again in, in case of rotating uh, blades not necessarily that after it crosses the moving blades same, same quantity of the fluid again enters to the uh, flex blades. So, these losses that I mean the fluid the moving blade charge the fluid. So, for that things we call this as a fanning losses. So, basically for fixed blade we have admission losses and for moving blades we have fanning losses. And the net effect of uh, when you do the, uh, the combined things like when we are doing compounding either pressure or velocity compounding then the net effect uh, or net loss that comes out from this uh, the uh, fixed and then moving blades we call this as a blade windage loss. The other type of situations that may arise the nature of the flow. So, what happens is that uh, normally for when you go for high pressure steam or and high temperature steam there is a possibility and then this expansion takes place. So, there is a possibility that fluid is no longer becomes not laminar. So, it becomes turbulent. So, this turbulent because of this region also the uh, because of this since the, uh, the angles and the entrance angles of, of the steams may not suit to the design loads. So, when we have laminar or turbulent flows that passes through the blades then we can encounter the boundary layers. So, we have we may have a laminar or turbulent boundary layers 
if turbulent boundary layers are encountered, then we can say there is a losses that happens due to the nature of the flow. But however, looking at the kind of expansion that we takes place from high pressure steam, the fluid friction losses is almost close to 10 percent from all available energy sources. Another important uh, phenomena is leakage. So, leakage is a very common when you uh, expand the steam up from high pressure sides. And of course, whether uh, except for single stays, all other things like we have moving plates, uh, nozzles, reaction turbines, uh, array of uh, fixed and moving plates, there are possibilities that steam leaks out either from the fixed plate or from the nozzles. So, uh, the leak that can happen from shaft bearings, uh, this leak can happen also from the outside of the turbines. So, we require proper sealing from them and because of these regions whether it is a reaction or impulse and when you are looking at very high pressure steams. So, there is a possibility that leak can happen from any of the stages and in fact higher is the pressure drop uh, greater is the leakage because greater is the tip to clearance to the blade height. And this uh, leakage loss normally at a designer point of view contributes 1 percent of the total energy available to the turbine. Moving further, uh, another leakage that can happen with through the external glands, then uh, leakage loss can also be part of the blade tips and casing. Uh, and the leakage are higher uh, when the pressure is high. Uh, so, that is the reason. So, it is uh, mainly advisable to use impulse stays at high pressure regions and reaction stages at low pressure region. So, at low pressures the friction losses becomes more important than the leakage. The another very vital feature of steam turbines whether uh, it is irrespective of the stages or impulse or reactions or cortis stage or uh, reactive turbine whatever may be process you use, if you look at the thermodynamic viewpoint that at the end of expansion the fluid must be at least steam quality should be at least 88 percent that is minimum quantity, minimum steam quality should be 88 percent. So, that means most of the fluids must that means the fluid must pass through the turbines when it is with minimum of 88 percent quality and more and more it encounters liquid droplets in the turbine expansion, it creates the thermal endurance and we call this as a moisture loss because the normally the for all types of blades uh, they are designed that it is designed for handling only steam not water droplet. And another important uh, aspect of this high pressure moisture content is that they cause blade erosions as a result of impingement of water droplets on the blades. So, this has to be an unavoidable affair. The last or uh, most other losses that is miscellaneous losses. So, this miscellaneous losses uh, comes into the fact that where we take the consideration of leaving losses, which means leaving losses means that uh, for a power plant to operate the at its best capability, we must have a residual velocity in the range of 300 meter per second. And uh, we also expect that when the steam uh, the velocity or the, the liquids that leaves the after condensation uh, that leaves, they will have a velocity of close to 300 meter per second. And uh, if you do that, then uh, there, there could be a losses and they add off the losses close to 3 percent. So, through low velocity also can lead to inappropriate design of the blades and too high velocity is also not advisable because we can encounter many reaction stages. The possibilities of this thing that either you improve the number of reaction stages or you leave this fluid velocity at a higher level. But many a times the infrastructure difficulty helps us that we should not go for a higher number of stages. So, rather 
we have to live with some residual velocity of the steam uh, which may be higher, but it is the need of the design. Apart from this, uh, since we are looking at very high pressure and, uh, and high temperature steam, so there is a possibility that heat transfer can take place either in any of the modes conduction, convection and radiations. Of course, they are too small uh, these losses because most of the cases the protections or insulations are provided. Next and last one is like uh, uh, not with respect to power point of the steam point of view, rather with respect to how you are extracting the power from the turbines. So, either in a electrical way or in mechanical way. So, that loss that means that that means it is like a generator or through any kind of uh, rotor which extract power in rotating the blades and this is usually 99 percent and these rotating velocities normally is kept at 3000 rpm and this comes this accounts for about 1 percent of the turbine losses and that has to be the to the best possible extent we have to minimize this. Okay. So, these are the uh, losses that uh, we have see in the steam turbines. So, with this we conclude uh, this. Now, before we leave, I will try to solve a numerical problems and mainly to emphasize the fact that how the wheel velocity or axial velocity that gets generated in a turbine. So far, we have not accounted for any kind of axial velocity while solving the pre previous problems. Here, we will try to emphasize the concept of the wheel velocity and axial velocity and how that propagates for transformation of thrust and power. So, corresponding thrust that we get either it is a tangential thrust which is caused due to uh, wheel velocity and axial thrust which is caused due to axial velocity and all these things we can find out from this velocity diagrams. So, the problem statement that says that we have a two row velocity compounded impulse turbines which is shown here. The stream from the nozzle exist is 600 meter per second. So, we have a nozzle which is it gives a 600 meter per second and it the nozzle hits this blade at an angle 16, 16 degree. And because of these things, we have this moving blade velocity is 20 meter per seconds, and the steam is supplied at a rate 5 kg per seconds. Now, here the exit angles for first row that is the first row of moving blade and fixed blade and second row of moving blade first, uh, then fixed blade, then second row of moving blades. So, we have two rows of moving blades which is organized by a one set of stationary blades. So, these angles are 18 degree, 22 degree and 36 degree. So, these angles uh, we can clarify once you draw the velocity diagrams or properly for each of these moving blades as well as the stationary blades. So, basically there are only four diagrams one is inlet of moving blade, inlet of this, then inlet of second set of moving blades and outlet of second set of moving blades. And for each velocity cases, the blade velocity coefficient is 85 percent. And because of this 85 percent, we can see that there always exists an axial thrust because complete velocity transformation normally does not take place. So, we will try to solve the problems, but before that, we have to draw these velocity diagrams clearly. So, before that, uh, similar problems we have already solved in your in the in our previous lectures. Here we will try to focus on uh, the final or summary part of this velocity diagrams. I will not derive this uh, formulas uh, because they are already part of our previous velocity diagrams. So, here we will try to see how this velocity diagram should look like. So, if you say this first moving blade. So, when you see this first set of moving blades, what we see we have V b for this velocity V b, this is comes corresponding stream velocity is V s 1 
BB, BS1 and this angle we say as theta and this angle we say as phi BR1 and you drop a vertical. Then for this outlet we have this B R2 B R2 B S2 and we can drop a vertical here you can draw it here and let us see what is this uh, wheel but after drawing this velocity diagrams you name this as A B C this naming was done in, in same manner as we did in the in our previous problem then here we have P we have R. So, talking about the angle this is theta and phi and this angle uh, is delta and this angle is gamma so you can write this as gamma we have here too then we can find what is this wheel velocity wheel velocity is this total that is delta p w 1 and if you see here there is a difference in the velocity in the axial direction which is b a 1 and this happens when we have the first set of moving blades and similar triangles we can draw for the fixed blade. So, fixed blade means or we say it is a stationary blades we call this as a guide vane. Now, here also for same velocity v b we have v s 3 because s 2 we have v s 3 enters this is angle theta instead of theta I put theta 1 and v r 3 this angle instead of phi we say it is phi 1. So, you can drop a vertical and from here also we have we can draw like this outlet where we can say it is V R 4 and V S 4. These angles can be rewritten as delta 1 initially it was delta now it is here it was delta and here it was delta 1. So, we can find out uh, you can drop a vertical here. So, the velocity triangles can be named as A1, B1, C1, D1, P1 and R1. So, then we have this delta we can find out that this angle is 180 minus delta this is 180 minus delta. So, here uh, also we have this net wheel velocity is delta B w which is the net effect of velocity in the tangential direction which gives the thrust or blade velocity and the net axial velocity we can find out this difference that is V a 2. So, total or delta V a 1 and delta V a 2. So, we have all the angles of course, which is left out is this is gamma 1, this is gamma 1. Okay. So, having said this, we can recall our previous analysis and try to frame this uh, formulas for uh, moving blades and the fixed blades. So, I am writing them as tan phi that is equal to B s 1 sin theta divided by B s 1 cos theta minus B b. Then we have B r 1 sin phi is equal to B s 1 sin theta. Okay. Now, for this outlet velocity triangle we say tan delta is equal to V r 2 sin gamma divided by B b 
minus v r 2 cos gamma. Here it was stream velocity, here it is relative velocity. And then for the fixed blade, similar relationship we can say tan phi 1 is equal to V s 3 uh, sin theta 1 divided by V s 3 because for this fixed blade the inlet triangle is V s 3 and outlet triangle is 4. So, V s 3 cos theta 1 th minus V b. Similarly, we say V r 3 sin phi 1 is equal to V s 3 sin theta 1. Okay. So, all these things are given. Now, let us understand what are the data given. So, the data given are V b is equal to 120 meter per second, V s 1 is equal to 600 meter per second, theta is 16 degree. Then so for the fixed blade theta 1 is 22 degree, gamma 1 is 36 degree and gamma is 18 degree and for all this case we say coefficient k v is equal to 0 0.85. Now, from this uh, formula and uh, these things first thing we need to calculate what is tan phi tan phi is equal to 600 sin 16 divided by 600 cos 16 minus 120. So, this is 0 0.362 which implies phi is 19.9 degree. Then we have V r 1 is equal to 600 sin 16 divided by sin 19.9. So, this number is 485.8 meter per seconds. So, this is V r 1 we have k V. So, this gives you V r 2 is equal to 0 0.85 times 485.8. So, V r 2 we get as 413 meter per second. Now, the second part analysis we can find what is tan delta. So, tan delta would be 413, 413 is V r 2 sin gamma is 18 divided by 413 sin 18 minus 120. So, tan delta becomes 0 0.5. 4, 7, which means delta is equal to 25 degree. Now, from this analysis, so we say now we can find out V s 2 is equal to V r 2 sin gamma divided by sin delta. So, this is 413 sin 18 divided by sin 25, that is 301 meter per second. So, that means we say V s 3 is equal to K V times V s 2 and that is 255.9. From this velocity diagram now we will be able to find out what is wheel velocity delta V w stage 1 that is equal to V s 1 cos theta plus V s 2 cos delta. So, this is 600 cos 16 plus 301 cos 25 degree. So, that is 850 meter per second and delta V a 2 would be V s 1 sin theta minus V s 2 sin delta. So, this is 600 sin 16 minus 301 sin 25. So, this number is 13.5.
37.8 meter per second. So, in similar way we can find out we can find out what is tan phi 1 that is twice 55.9 sin 22 divided by 255.9 cos 22 minus 120. So, this is 0 0.81. So, we get phi 1 as 39.3 degree. So, once you know the phi 1 then we have B R 3 as B S 3 sin theta 1 divided by sin phi 1. So, this is 151.5 meter per second. So, we have B R 3 then B R 4 is 0 0.85 times B R 3 that is 128.7 meter per second. So, we are now VR3, VR4. So, we will be now in a position to find out delta V W2. It is VR3 cos phi 1 plus VR4 cos gamma 1 and delta V A1 would be B S 3 sin theta 1 minus B R 4 cos gamma 1. So, by inserting the values we say delta B W 2 would be 151.5 cos 39.3 plus 128.7 cos 36. So, it is 2 to 1.4 meter per second and delta V A 2 each similarly we can get 20.2 meter per second. So, we have all the numbers now we will be able to uh, find out what is tangential thrust. Okay. So, total delta V W would be delta V W 1 plus delta V W 2 that is 850 plus 220. So, this is 220 1070 meter per second. Delta V A is delta V A 1 plus delta V A 2. This is 37.8 plus 20.2. So, this is roughly 58 meter per seconds. So, this is the total real velocity and this is the total axial velocity. Then let us see tangential thrust A P T that is equal to m times delta B W. So, m dot is given m dot is 5 kg per seconds. So, P T becomes 5.35 kilo Newton. Second part axial thrust P A m dot into delta V A. So, that means P A becomes 0 0.29 kilo Newton. Power developed W dot is nothing but P T into V B. Thrust is 5.35 into V B, V B is uh, 120. So, 5.35 into 120 W dot becomes 642 kilowatt. And last part efficiency, blade efficiency that is twice time delta V W into V B divided by V 1 V S 1 square. So, this is 2 into 
120 divided by 600 into 600. So, efficiency blade efficiency is now 71.3 percent. So, idea of this problem is to give some emphasis that for a steam turbine what is the concept of tangential thrust and axial thrust and how what is the concept of wheel velocity and axial velocity. And we say that this uh, axial thrust has to be there because we need a balancing force if since rotor is rotating we need also need a balancing force that has to come from the steam. So, it must provide some axial thrust to counterbalance the reactions developed by the rotor. Okay. With this I conclude. Thank you for your attention.